My name is Julie Edwards. I'm the CEO of Jesuit Social Services and together with Tamara Domicelli, um, who is the Country Director of Jesuit Refugee Service Australia, uh, we co-chair the Catholic Alliance for People Seeking Asylum, otherwise known as CAPSA. And tonight is, of course, a CAPSA event. And I welcome you very much to tonight's event called CAPSA in Conversation, Building a Better Future Together. I begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands, many lands across Australia that we are zooming in from tonight and paying our respects to elders past and present any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people with us tonight. And we know that um, this has been a bit of a tumultuous time actually for um, Aboriginal people across the country. And we uh, express our gratitude to you for your ongoing forbearance and for all you do to care for land, water, country, each other. So we express that quite genuinely from our hearts. Thank you. Um, I also want to acknowledge that tonight um, there will be people uh, with lived experience of seeking asylum with us tonight or people who are close to or family members of people seeking asylum and that um, hopefully tonight I'm sure will be a very hope-filled and positive event but when we come together to talk about these matters sometimes they raise things for us that are that trouble us or that are concerning and so I suppose I just encourage you um, to uh, reach out to family member a friend um, also to potentially to someone from Jesuit social services or Jesuit refugee service if you feel you want to uh, connect with someone you'd be very welcome to do that so tonight's webinar is uh, being held during CAPS's annual National Week of Prayer and Action, which started last Sunday on World Migrant and Refugee Sunday, which is an international Catholic celebration uh, of migrants, refugees and people seeking asylum. Pope Francis announced that one of the themes for this year is about building the future with migrants and refugees. So we thought it was a wise move to take our lead from him. And our focus tonight will be on, on that, building the future. Um, all through this week, tonight is just one of the actions that CAPSA is taking. So all through the week, we're calling on CAPSA community, that's you and us, uh, to use our voice, heart, resources, and time resources, hearts, voice and time to build the kind of future we all want in Australia that is just and compassionate and inclusive. And so we're going to take those four themes tonight through our four speakers and touch into those. The first tonight uh, person we'll be hearing from is Blaise Idabello from Community Refugee Sponsorship Australia. And Blaise is going to talk to us about using our time to build a better future. Maeve Brown from Jesuit Refugee Service Australia will speak to us about using our resources to build a better future. Sister Bridget Arthur from the Bridgetine Asylum Seeker Project will speak to us about using our hearts to build a better future. And then Magdalene Conner from Jesuit Refugee Service Refugee Leaders Program will talk to us about using our voice to build a better future. So we're really looking forward to hearing from those presenters and we're grateful for your participation. As is our want, we begin these uh, sessions always with a reflection, a quiet moment to focus again on our purpose and why we're here. And I'm delighted tonight to invite Shuja Jamal, who's Head of Policy, Advocacy and Communications at Jesuit Refugee Service, um, to open our webinar with a short reflection. So over to you, Shuja. Thank you. Thank you very much, Julie. Um, at 7.45 p.m. on September the 27th of 2021, I landed in Darwin after evacuating from Kabul, Afghanistan. And I am aware that this is at the year mark almost to the hour. 
but before that, when I was stuck on the tarmac of the airport in Kabul on August 15 of 2021, with a dead phone and nowhere to go and nobody to call, I knew, I was sure that people outside of Afghanistan were trying to help me. It's just that I did not know because I was disconnected. Some were reaching out to find, if I, to find out if I was safe, worried that the worst might have happened. Some were buying airplane tickets for flights that were leaving the following day, but would in eventuality never really leave. One person was even trying to charter a private jet when they realized that commercial aviation was not was stopped at Kabul on that day. They were all using their voice, their time, their hearts, and their resources to help me. And I was a not a refugee by the legal definition, but for all practical purposes, I had fled my home, lost my job that afternoon, left behind all of my possessions. I was a refugee in my own city and I could not go back home that evening. It took me weeks and months after leaving Kabul to realize just how many people and in what different ways they tried to help me. And later, it wasn't until I joined GRS in, two, in June of 2022 that I realized just how many people in the community had sent 2,000 letters to the then Immigration Minister Alex Hawk and the 600 signature that had been collected from leading figures to ask for increased intake of Afghans facing persecution in Taliban-controlled Afghanistan. The work that this community did contributed directly or indirectly to my coming to safety and to the coming to safety of thousands of others from Afghanistan. And they continue to do to, to, to seek safety and come to safety as a result of that work. The many people who have arrived in Australia, like me, are living and working in communities across the country where we are starting to lay the foundations for our futures here. But our work is not done yet because there are many thousands of others um, who are in need of support, many thousands who rely on our ability to use our hearts, our voices, our time, and our resources for their safety. The work might sound daunting, but it is not something that this community has not done before. August of 2021, I think, is a glowing example of the work that we can be proud of as this community. One poem that always struck with me is from Rumi, who himself actually was a refugee as a child because his family had to flee a region that is now in modern day Afghanistan. It was the land that gave him refuge, which is in modern day Turkey, that became uh, that made him the Sufi mystic and leader uh, whose thoughts and whose poems actually shines a light across the world. One of his poems that always struck with me is in Farsi, but the rough translation is, don't say that the whole world is at war. What will come only of me making peace? You are not one but thousands you light your own candle. I think as a collective of individuals with purpose, we become a community of thousands, like Rumi said, as an energized community using our voices, our time, our hearts, and our resources, we light thousands of candles that can help the many that need our help. And in doing that, we build a future together in this country and in the world over. Thank you. Thank you, Shuja. Let's just pause for 30 seconds and ponder Shuja's words, which really put it back to us as individuals, what we can do collectively, but it starts with us. So let's just ponder that for a moment. Shuja, I'm very grateful that we have you, someone with lived experience, speak to us tonight and not only what you do tonight, but what you're doing um, as part of CAPS and more broadly through your work at Jesuit Refugee Service. So thanks very much. So I'd now like to introduce our first speaker of the night, Blaise Itabello, who's the Community Engagement Manager at Community Refugee Sponsorship Australia will speak to us about how we can use our time. Blaise was born in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, sadly, in 19, the 1996 war 
as a result of that in DRC, um, Blaze and his family were forced to flee and they spent the next decade and a half in a refugee camp. So that was home for a decade and a half. Blaze migrated to Australia in 2011 and he's a proud Australian citizen. He was ex he's extensively worked on assisting newly arrived migrants, refugees and people seeking asylum in their settlement journey in Australia. Blaze has over 10 years experience doing community engagement and development work with a particular interest in community capacity building and mobilization and has had roles with local and international NGO NGOs, including Access Community Service, SSI and World Share. Thank you, Blaze. We look forward to hearing from you. Thank you so very much, Julie, for that um, a very wonderful introduction. And Shuja, I think we couldn't have a better way of starting this webinar today without uh, really hearing from you. And uh, the thought that you just shared. Again, I'm very humbled to be part of uh, this webinar. And just before I say anything, I wanted to take you to a very quick journey, a journey that you've probably heard a little bit um, about so far. Um, but if you can, if I can just take you to a quick journey, I'll probably share this with a few people that have heard me speaking in the past, but I just hope tonight will be another day that we both walk together and I will come back again in, into our topic for the day. Most of the time when I'm sharing this, I try to close my eyes because I want to picture the journey that I'm talking about. And this is a journey of um, someone who lived in his community someone who's very well respected, had dreams about, you know, his future and the future of his children. And the children had also dreams in terms of what they wanted to achieve. But overnight, everything changed. He left his country and ended up in a new country. The reputation, the hard work he has put into his future and the future of his children, all the properties, cars and everything he ever dream of owning or everything that he owned, was gone overnight. And you would think that was enough, but things escalated very quickly. Not only that he lost the possessions, his name, his place in the community also let what was gone. They referred to him into numbers or into names that were not his birth names or anything else. I like sharing this story or most of the times reflecting on this before I talk about, you know, the role that communities can always play when it comes to refugees. The story that I just shared is a story of my father. And this is a story that my father and I share with millions of other refugees around the world. It is a story that other men and women, children out there are actually going through as we speak today. Now, when I got an invitation to speak today, it is possibly my first engagement where I'm speaking with people that I share the same faith with. I'm a Christian and I was born in a Christian family. And I did a lot of reflection because my mind, I thought maybe I will start talking about, you know, the role of communities, but my mind was taking me elsewhere. And I should probably, I'm not sure, and I didn't ask if I should do this, but I was actually taken to reflect on um, the book of uh, the the book the gospel of Matthew chapter two the old chapter and I've gone through it today several times and I've gone through it several times it's because of Jesus when he was born I I thought about being in that same position you know I, I thought about my father being in the same position the all the only the one difference being that my father wasn't warned that you know if you stay here your child may be killed. And therefore, you have to leave early. I don't think if uh, Paul Joseph ever thought about leaving, you know, his own country. And as we all know, he didn't even think about the trouble that was coming his way. Um, but he had to flee. And I pictured myself into that position today. But also I reflected on the millions of other refugees that, you know, we, we're hearing today. I was looking on the statistics, the UNHCR estimate that are over 80 million people that are internally displaced um, or refugees is about over 20 million people that are refugees. And I happen to come from Congo, a country that is in the top 10. I shared recently top 10 of producers of refugees, something that uh, for many you would think, what well, would you say that? 
I would say that because we're actually one of the top 10 countries that are very wealthy when it comes to natural resources, but we are not known for that. We are known in producing refugees. And so my heart goes out to all the refugees out there, all the people seeking asylum and those that are internally displaced without forgetting the thousands that we've got in Australia right now that their statuses remain unresolved. After saying that, I thought I will maybe quickly share with you as well in terms of what we do. I work with CRISA, Community Refugee Sponsorship Australia, and we're a new organization, but really our role and what we stand for is to lead in encouraging, developing and supporting programs that expand and improve refugee settlement in Australia by harnessing the generosity, goodwill and social capital of groups of everyday Australians. As you may agree with me, Australia, will quite, Australia is a very generous country. We've, uh, there are a lot of stories. Um, I can go back from uh, the Cambodian crisis, the Vietnam crisis. Australians are known to opening their doors and welcoming strangers. Australians are known to taking lead, leadership when it comes to intervening in crisis and really showing our humanitarian heart every time there is, um, there is a crisis around the world. Some of you will know, if you've ever been overseas in a country where English wasn't a popular language or a non-English speaking country, you will agree with me that every time you walked around the street and someone spoke English or someone looked like you, as in terms of the color of their skin, you know, you felt a little bit comforted. For many refugees, people seeking asylum, coming to Australia is the last thing many people prefer doing because it's so dangerous for people seeking asylum. The risk they take for refugees, for example, you know, they know everybody in their home country. They know how to navigate the system, but unfortunately coming to Australia can be an exciting thing for many people. But often that brings a lot of challenges. Yes, you escape war. Yes, you are now safe. Nobody will, at will attack your child or your wife or your mother. But at the same time, you have the language to learn. You have the system to navigate. You've got everything, the law, including how to use the oven for people that came from villages. And all this can be complex. Not, a, not, a ben, not again forgetting that you still need to understand who's the person that lives next to your house. Which course should you study to get a job? And how do you even start in getting a job? Because even the CV resume preparation is different from the country you come from. For many refugees coming to Australia is exciting, but at the same time, very challenging. For people seeking asylum, this is the only result they probably have. And it can be exciting, but at the same time, very challenging to a point where for many people, this brings not just excitement that people have been looking for, but the worst nightmares of their lives. Because every day there is a question about how am I going to survive here without my uncle, without my auntie, without a network of supporters or people that will guide me in surviving in my new land. I would love to think we are blessed today in Australia that we've at least got a formal process of community refugee sponsorship, a program that I've started in Canada for over 40, uh, 40 years. And I've just been blessed enough over the last three weeks I visited Canada. And I've got to meet a few organizations that have worked in this space. I would like to share a few things with you. A number of things that I've learned, and I want you to recall, if you can remember very, very quickly, um, when the Syrian and Iraqi crisis started, I want you to remember what was the Australian intake in terms of refugees from those two countries and what was Canadian intake of those refugees. Our numbers were far less you know, than Canada. But there is a reason why. Because in Canada, refugees and people seeking asylum are no longer political footballs. At least one in five Canadians have had an experience of dealing directly or supporting or had a friend who identify as having a refugee background or someone seeking asylum. Today, all I would really want to share with you as my, in my final remark, we've got an opportunity of changing this nation. We've got an opportunity of continuing showing our generosity when it comes to strangers. And I thought, again, I will go back into Matthew chapter 25. If you can read verse 31 up, up to 46, and here, and I'm really sorry if I wasn't supposed to be referring to um, 
you know, it in my my Christianity faith here, but I feel very comfortable to share with you all that I think we are called to be generous to strangers, to people that we don't know of. And an opportunity is with us in Australia that a group of everyday Australians today can form a group and welcome and supporting a refugee in their community. A program that is available today and I'm sure informations will be shared and we can all do what it takes of giving a refugee a new beginning in the country. These are programs that are designed in a way that when Blaze is coming to Australia, before I come in this country, I already know Shuja, I already know Margaret in the community. And these will be my new friends. These will be my uncles. These will be the people that will take me and to navigate the local system in our community. We believe this could be not just good for refugees, but also good for our country, that at least will hold our, politi our politicians uh, into account. We will also be, have an opportunity of fulfilling what you know the what Jesus wants us to do, being nice and kind to strangers, opening our doors for people that we don't know, and giving them something to eat. So, with those few words, let me thank you all, and I hope I can I'll be here for some more questions. Again, thank you, Julie, and thank you, Blaze, and uh, thanks for uh, sharing that story of uh, your father, but your own story too, but also um, for letting us see that really we can give our time and in a really practical way. And as you said, that when you look at the Canadian model of one in five Canadians actually having direct experience and relationship with someone who's come through a process like that, I think um, this could be a really transformative program in Australia where built on relationship, with people who are seeking asylum or who are refugees, um, that we come to know one another more. And I think that's a really great example about how we can give, as you call it, new beginning for people. So thank, thanks very much. I'd now like to uh, introduce Maeve Brown. Maeve is the Assistant Country Director at Jesuit Refugee Service Australia. And Maeve's going to speak to us about how we can use our resources. Maeve has over 16 years experience working in the community sector with people from migrant and refugee backgrounds. She's currently at Jesuit Refugee Service and has been there since 2014. Maeve's passionate about working collaboratively to ensure that people who have been forcibly displaced have access to the rights and the support needed to rebuild their lives in Australia with safety and dignity. Look forward to hearing from you, Maeve. Thank you. Thank you for that, Julie. Um, now I'm just going to try and share my screen and I hope that that goes smoothly. So just give me one second. Okay, now I hope everyone can can see that all right. Um, thank you again for, for having me uh, tonight for this webinar. Uh, as Julie said, my name is Maeve Brown and I'm the Assistant Country Director for Jesuit Refugee Service Australia. Um, I'm joining you tonight from Burra Madigal land, uh, the land of the, the Darug people. Um, Burra Madigal is uh, where Parramatta gets its name and I'd like to pay my respects to elders past and present as well as any other First Nations people on the line. Um, I'm going to walk you through a bit of the history, mission and values of JRS, um, but also talk about the work that we're doing in Australia, the people that we serve, and um, keeping on the theme of resources, how you can get involved um, and what you can do to support people living in your community. Okay. Um, so as you may be aware, JRS is an international Catholic organization with a mission to accompany, serve, and advocate uh, for the rights of forcibly displaced people uh, all over the world. I think we're, we're active in about 57 countries, possibly more at the moment. Um, and we were founded by Father Pedro Arupe, who was the Superior General of the Jesuits um, and in 1980. And if you think back to what was happening in the world in 1980, uh, there were lots of people who were fleeing by boat to neighboring countries, largely from Vietnam. And Father Arupe thought that 
the Jesuits would be well placed to respond, um, both in terms of their their location within Asia Pacific, but also in terms of the resources that they had available uh, to support those um, who were leaving their countries. Now, he also thought that this would be a temporary measure and that people um, could be mobilized, resources could be mobilized, but then um, those that were seeking safety would either be able to resettle in, in third countries or they would be able to return home. Uh, but we know that that took a very long time and for some people that wasn't the case, which leads us to today, um, where unfortunately situations of conflict around the world um, have only grown and situations of displacement have only become more protracted. And I know that there's research to say that um, stats don't necessarily change people's minds, but I think it is important to to see the scale of, of the numbers of people who have been forced to flee um, in recent years. As, as Blaise was saying, um, it's 89.3 million people in 2021 who were forcibly displaced. Um, and that's that's including um, some of the people that left Afghanistan or, or had to flee within Afghanistan, um, as Shuja was saying. And it's not including uh, the people that have had to flee this year um, due to the war in Ukraine. 60% of those people were internally displaced, which means they were not able to cross a border and seek refugee status in a neighboring country, um, either through UNHCR or through um, another, another government. For those that could flee, uh, the majority went to, to Turkey, to Colombia, to Pakistan, to Uganda, to Germany. And of that, there were 57,500 people who were resettled. Um, that is low due to COVID, but it's usually not much higher than 100 or 150,000 people um, resettled through official pathways. If you think about that in relation to nearly 90 million people needing a safe place, um, it's it's tiny. And within that, 13,307 uh, were granted uh, humanitarian visas within Australia, and that's a mix of people who were recognized by UNHCR, and brought to Australia, um, as well as people who sought asylum by plane and were granted visas on shore. So what happens when you don't have pathways to safety? What happens when you need to flee and you know that there are very few options available? Um, when you get to another country and yeah, there's no prospect of resettlement, there's no right to work, there's no option for schooling for your children, you're at risk of detention or arrest. Um, at that stage, lots of people get on boats or get on planes and try and seek safety any way that they can. Um, JRS in Australia is particularly working with people who are in the process of seeking asylum, um, many of whom have spent prolonged periods of time in other countries before coming to Australia, but also have spent some nine plus years waiting on an outcome um, to find out whether or not they're able to be granted a visa to start their lives in Australia. So as I, I mentioned, um, the mission of, of JRS is to accompany, serve and advocate. Um, we're working with people in situations of great vulnerability um, where people are the most marginalized, but also where we can do the greatest good. Um, and a lot of that is is in partnership. So looking for partners, both with, with organizations and with government, but also with local communities. Um, as, as mentioned, we're largely working with people seeking asylum and migrants on temporary visas. And we provide a range of casework support, emergency relief, uh, access to food, employment support, um, education and training programs, as well as um, specific casework and uh, capacity building for women who've experienced violence. Um, we also advocate alongside people and, um, and that's at the local, state, national and international level. Um, and we support people to tell their stories and to raise the issues that are impacting on their lives. Um, and if you look on the right there, you'll, you'll see Magdalene, who will be speaking later tonight. So that's a bit about what we do in a very brief wrap up. Um, but what can you do? 
Uh, this is a, a great quote from Pope Francis, um, that a single individual is enough for hope to exist, and that individual could be you. So what can you do next? I guess keeping on the theme of, of voice, heart, um, time, and resources, I'm going to overlap a little bit um, because I've, I've broken it down um, into time, funds, food, and opportunities. So one of the things that you could do um, with JRS Australia is to volunteer your time. Um, some of that could be quite practical support. It could be um, food deliveries or, or food packing for, for some of the work that we're currently doing um, to show, ensure that people have access to food. It could be helping people search for employment, um, things like office duties on the phone or, or doing reception, um, but it could also be helping out at uh, community lunches or one-off events or, or programs that we're running um, at different times of the year, say for so Refugee Week or for, for other events that might be happening. You could also volunteer and get involved with our, our advocacy work. Um, you could give your time to, to joining a campaign. You could write letters to your local MP. You could mobilize your parish and join um, join a march, uh, and I know that's that can be a big step when when you might not know all the issues. But that's that's also something that you could do is is to invite people to speak um, to your community to learn about what's happening, to to learn about um, the advocacy that's happening around uh, increasing visa pathways for people from Afghanistan, um, converting. Uh, temporary protection visas into permanent visas, looking at family reunion, looking at access to um, yeah, a financial safety net as people seeking asylum don't have access to Centrelink. So all of those things, um, we need the voices of, of local people, of um, so particularly constituents in different electorates to, um, to be able to raise their voices and, and say that this is something that matters to them. We also um, quite practically need funds to do the work that we do. Um, we're largely funded by donations from individuals, parishes, schools, um, some philanthropic foundations and little bits of, of government money that will we'll be running out because it was largely um, COVID focused over the last few years. But the work we do is, is quite, um, quite unique and quite specialized in terms of I guess the range of issues that we're supporting people with because they have yeah, such a lack of access to other government services. So we have to be across a lot of different issues and filling in a lot of different gaps. Um, so that support to be able to provide um, professional casework support, to be able to provide um, employment support, it's it's crucial to the work that we're doing to support people to um, yeah to get on their feet and to to be able to not be um, reliant on charity support. Food is also a popular one. Um, and I, I love this photo. And these are not um, beneficiaries or clients of, of JRS. Uh, these are donors. This is um, a family, uh, sort of cousins and friends that get together every Ramadan to collect food for JRS. Um, and they come into the office and they pack um, they purchase all the food and then they pack, um, which is an incredible gift to um, people that we're working with, particularly as cost of living is going up and people are having to make choices between food, rent, medication, um, yeah, and other other quite vital daily costs. Um, so, if if people are interested in in food donation, please get in touch because we do have a particular list that we we go off of. Um, noting the different foods that that people do eat. Um, so yeah, there's those contract details at the end that I can go through. And the last one, um, opportunities. So if you're someone who has um, has a business or who has skills and knowledge in a particular sector and you're able to share that with people who are in the early stages of trying to find work in Australia or people who've been stuck for quite a long time trying to get that first job and trying to get a foot in the door. Um, your your knowledge of navigating um, the Australian job market uh, of different 
of different business sectors, um, networks that people just don't have when they they first arrive in Australia. Um, that's incredible. That's that's a huge resource that um, could be given through your time um, volunteering for the the employment team. Um, some of it is just practical support as well of um, being able to help people through that journey of putting in applications and preparing for interviews and um, yeah, getting through all those all the paperwork that people have to do when they start a new job. Um, but yeah, that that sharing of um, knowledge and opportunities is is something that we're trying to to grow within our our volunteer pool as well. Now I've put together some contact details, which I'm I'm happy to share um, with Maeve possibly, um, and I can I can turn this into a, a PDF that could be circulated if people do want to get in touch. That's great, Maeve. I'm wondering whether you put it in the chat even and Maeve. Oh, oh, I've noticed I'm... Maeve's actually the other Maeve. <laughs> some of this information in the chat but yeah feel, please feel free to do that and then people could follow up that'd no be great and sorry i'm on my last slide i promise uh, <laughs> and same thing if, if people want other resources um that i noted in this presentation so um we, i can share the the jrs annual report as well as unhcr and um department of home affairs stats and thank you um on behalf of jrs and the people we serve i i greatly appreciate the um the opportunity to speak to you and the time that you've given up to listen and hope to hear from some of you soon thanks very much Maeve and thanks for outlining so many practical ways that um in fact we can all use our resources to contribute to the work of um JRS and others um and that brings me to uh Sister Bridget Arthur the next person we're going to hear from um so uh Bridget, I think many people will know Bridget, is a Bridgetine sister uh, who grew up in um, the Wimmera rural country of Caniva. And uh, Bridget's going to talk to us about how we may can use our hearts uh, to build a better future for people. Um, Bridget began uh, her teaching career as a, as a Bridgetine nun. I was myself personally educated by the Bridgetines and uh, very practical, grounded response. And um, I think what Bridget's passion for educating everyone and for opening it up that everyone has a right to education, that all are welcome, extended all throughout her career. And then from 2001 on, as it became clear about the needs of people seeking asylum, um, Bridget, together with Catherine Kelly, uh, founded the Bridgetine Asylum Seeker Project and uh, it continues to grow and we're very grateful for our relationship with, with Bridget and, and all that she does in, in um, the local community. So Bridget, over to you to share a bit with us about how we can use our hearts to build a better future. Thank you, Bridget. Thanks, Julie. <clears throat> and thanks to the other speakers who have already said some many of the things that I'd like to say too. Um, how can we use our heart? Uh, well, I guess that's about compassion. Um, and compassion is different to things like empathy, uh, where you can walk in the shoes of other people you feel, feel for other people, or altruism, where you think of others rather than yourself. Uh, but I think the distinctive thing about compassion uh, is that uh, we can feel for others who are suffering but we are also motivated to try to relieve their suffering. And so I think we're challenged uh, by this whole issue of asylum seekers and refugees uh, to actually do something. Um, in terms of Bridgetine Asylum Seeker Project or BASP as we um, call ourselves, uh, we have existed for over 20 years. Um, and we see ourselves as doing two things, offering practical help uh, and advocating for change. Uh, we work here in Victoria, in Melbourne, and so many of the things that Maeve has said uh, apply um, equally to the sort of things we're trying to do. We're not international. Uh, we just um, are confined to Victoria almost totally. Occasionally we give some help to somebody outside the state. Um, 
but we do do a lot of practical help and and we try to keep the issue before uh, people so that we can change the consciousness of the public. Uh, I think that's often done uh, through our hearts um, because if we tell stories or we introduce people uh, who have come here seeking protection to others, uh, then that does change that consciousness. Um, we, um, we're challenged at the moment in terms of a huge number of people uh, needing the practical help um, around particularly housing uh, because many of the people who, I think as Maeve said, um, uh, who are asylum seekers don't get any um, income and they can't pay for their rent, nor can they pay for utilities or food or whatever, but rent and utilities are the two biggest things. And because all other help from government has now gone, or almost all, uh, there's one little wee bit of SRSS left, that's a special payment for those who are vulnerable, but really and honestly, that could be uh, multiplied many, many times over uh, if we were going to actually, as a community, address the needs. Uh, so. Um, we are, as I said, really, really challenged to try and help people stay in their own homes and not become destitute and indeed uh, homeless. Uh, we get a lot of community help and that reminds us that, you know, as human beings, we're communal uh, and social and at our best, uh, we help each other. Um, as Catholics, uh, and in a Christian, part of our Christian culture, I think, uh, is that our biblical tradition is about helping the vulnerable. Jesus often spoke about a new world order that he called the kingdom of God in sharp distinction to the Roman Empire with power and privilege at the hands of a few uh, and where people like lepers, um, mentally ill, landless, disenfranchised, uh, were treated as expendables, living in a perilous and a powerless situation. That sounds very similar to the lot of asylum seekers today. And Jesus turned about, uh, talked often in parables and other ways about turning this world upside down. In his narrative, this was right side up. This was a vision not just of Jesus but of a long line of prophets who came before him. I mean it was the um, the reading for last Sunday was about Amos. <clears throat> Amos was one of the um, prophets who didn't spare, didn't mince his words really and he railed against the rich who lived in summer palaces and slept on fine linen uh, while the poor people uh, were destitute. So I think uh, this is all about a lens, this provides us with a lens through which we can view reality, view the world, where each person, each person's life is precious. Someone from Somalia or Iraq or Burma is no less important than an Australian, where we share one home, one community. So the common good informs our consciousness and our decisions. I really liked uh, Suja's um, phrase, the collection of individuals with purpose. I think that's a lovely way of talking about the common good. So just to finish up, I think um, right now there are so many asylum seekers who are in a very difficult position. They have no security. They don't know what's going to happen in the future. We've done terrible things like taking away their liberty. We've certainly take, taken away their security. And the best thing that we can do is to get as many people in the community feeling and understanding that this is a, a very, deliberate choice on the part of governments and they represent us. Those governments represent us. And 
if we can get enough people to say that, that the way people are being treated who have come here just for protection is not representing me, then we will have done a great service. Thank you. Thank you, Bridget. And Bridget, thank you for reminding us as CAPSA, the Catholic Alliance for People Seeking Asylum, um, about our heritage, about the long line of prophets and right through to, of course, Jesus reminding us about the kind of world order uh, that we should be striving for, one where every person's life is precious and there's a particular attention to the needs of the most vulnerable or those on the margins. And um, also in that, also uh, to use that to fuel our hearts, but also to remind governments, as you said, they represent us. So we need to be clear in our own hearts about where we stand. So thanks very much for that reminder, Bridget. Um, greatly appreciated. Um, we now move on to our final speaker um, for the evening, Magdalene Cone. Magdalene is a sports journalist and she's also a speaker in JRS's Refugee Leaders Program. Um, Magdalene is originally from Sierra Leone and she's going to speak to us tonight about how we can use our voice. Magdalene came to Australia seeking asylum in 2018 after facing danger and death threats because of her activism against female genital mutilation back in her home country of Sierra Leone. And in Australia, Magdalene has continued to use her considerable journal journalist skills and passion to advocate for the rights of her community. Very pleased now to welcome Magdalene to speak to us about how we use our voice to build a better future. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, my name is Magdalene, and tonight I want to share with you my experience about how I have been using my voice. My whole life I've been using my voice to advocate for the rights of women and girls as a journalist and as an activist. Since I've been in Australia, I have been using my voice to advocate for the right of people seeking asylum, a community that I am part of. I am originally from Sierra Leone and I'm a journalist specifically focusing on sport. When I was in school, I like sports, but because my parents were too poor to afford sporting equipment for me, I couldn't um, play sport professionally, but I participated in various sports to school. When I went to college, I decided I wanted to do journalism. I major in sports because if I can't play professionally, I could at least be around what I like by talking and writing about it. I am passionate about sport. I love the act of journalism. I love informing people of the news and asking people to speak about what is affecting them. I was the first female journalist in Sierra Leone to cover the Olympic Games. I went to the Rio Games in 2016. I covered lots of international games and events in both Sierra Leone and outside of Sierra Leone. I've won the Believers um, Broadcast Network for Sport Journalists in 2017 in a National Entertainment Award. I've been nominated for an award since being in Australia because I've been writing a blog here. I talked about sport, but also politics. Growing up in Sierra Leone, I witnessed the negative impact of FGM on women and girls, also known as um, female genital mutilation. When I become, became a journalist, I decided to join other activists to campaign against this practice. I felt that I could use my voice to speak out against this and educate young girls not to go through the initiation. The people who were supposed to protect me turned against me as they felt I was talking against something which they think was a cultural tradition that is of importance to them. This is even though hundreds of girls and women died or had negative health complications after that. It reached a point where they were haunting me, trying to shut me off. All of a sudden, one night, I was attacked and severely beaten for something I feel we should work towards eradicating. These people 
who we are supposed to protect me, who turned against me, we are politicians, police and community elders. Those people use this particular practice as a political tool in not only Sierra Leone, but West Africa more generally. It is a political tool because families trade their girls for votes. After this, I ran away to Guinea, where FGM is also widely practiced. I was there for two months. Before all this had happened, I was able to get a visa to come to Australia for the 2018 Commonwealth Games to cover the games for Awoko newspaper in Sierra Leone. My friends helped me with getting my passport for my office back in Sierra Leone, and I had traveled from Guinea to the airport in Sierra Leone the same night as our flight. When I was in Australia covering the Commonwealth Games, I was receiving messages of threat that if I was found, I would be killed. My boss at the newspaper asked me to stop the coverage because as I was sending stories back to the paper, they knew I was somewhere else. I stopped writing and traveled from Brisbane to Sydney through the help of some friends, and I was introduced to GRS. I explained my story since then, GRS helped me to access some legal help, which helped me to apply for asylum. After applying for asylum, the government of Australia gave me a bridging visa while they looked into my case and to decide if they will grant me a protection visa. That was in 2018, and I'm still on a bridging visa. It's a long process, but I've been glad to have both work and study right. The worst night in Australia was when immigration sent me an email that contained my worst fears. They denied me protection and said that I could be sent back to Sierra Leone within 14 days. I didn't know what to do. I was crying all night. I thought this was the end for me because for me, staying in Australia for a day is better than staying in a country that doesn't respect human rights, a country which women don't have a voice, even though I am missing my loved ones, my immediate family. I called the GRS and the Asylum Seeker Center and they referred me to RACS, a legal organization that helped me um, to put my asylum case together. The government denied me because they said they couldn't provide, um, they couldn't prove that I was an activist because I didn't have pictorial ed evidence of me speaking out against FG. I didn't have pictures because that would have put me in more danger. I also didn't originally plan to seek asylum, so I, I didn't brought specific evidence with me. Rax helped me to appeal this decision and the lawyers spoke with me and explained the legal situation and that I will be okay. I applied for an appeal for which I am still waiting to appear for a hearing over four years. While waiting for this hearing, I've been able to do a lot of things to keep myself busy. I found out from the GRS that I could access some free study to TAFE and I completed my certificate three in community services. Another positive um, thing is that I've been able to work with the GRS to talk and advocate for people seeking asylum through speaking sessions at schools and colleges and also churches. I once again had the opportunity to sit in the radio station. I appeared on Radio Skid Row a radio station here in Sydney at Marrickville in an African Connection program where they speak about sport, economics, entertainment in the Africa context because of how I presented myself in the show. I was given a big opportunity to host my own podcast during the peak of COVID-19. And uh, that was to talk about how the, the COVID impacts the African community specifically um, with asylum seekers and refugees. I have worked in three other jobs which we are in full production. And um, the first job was okay, but the second job was like walking into hell every day. For some reason, the boss was a bully towards me and it's reached a point where I had to leave. She knew I was on bridging visa and I believe that's the reason she treated me how she did. And this is something that is happening to every refugee and asylum seekers because of the kind of visa we have. COVID had a huge impact on my life. My shift at work were reduced, and sometimes I didn't have a shift at all. I was managing at the start with my paycheck, but not paying for groceries and just ensuring I paid the rent. Then I was unable to pay the rent. I spoke to the real estate and asked for them to reduce the rent. They said they were unable to reduce it. I had to leave and was squatting with friends. I just passed the night wherever I was able to. 
I was in this situation for two months. This was when I was able to get the opportunity with the radio station, with, which helped me to survive through this time. Now with my certificates, I have been able to secure a job in the area I studied, which is more comfortable. I work with people who respect my efforts. During the second half of COVID, I was contacted by JRS asking if I was willing to share my story. I was happy to do so because I believe using my voice will not only help me, but it will be for the benefit of other people seeking asylum. Since then, I've been working with JRS using my voice to tell my story as someone with life experience so that people in Australia will understand what asylum seekers are going through. I want people to understand that people seeking asylum are not bad people. We are running away from persecution. We can do well if we have the opportunity. We can do a lot more if we have the breathing space. It's hard staying away from your family as they are also in danger. When you seek asylum, you have to start from zero. I went from having a big job as a journalist in Sierra Leone to coming to Australia and baking bread and cleaning a factory. If I had safety back in Sierra Leone, I wouldn't come here to start from zero. I want to say thanks to the people of Australia for giving people like me the opportunity to get a new life and live in a safer environment with so much opportunity, but also giving me the opportunity to speak up and talk for my community, which is the asylum seeker community of which I represent. Every time I tell a story, it reduces my level of depression and gives me a sense of hope. It makes me feel like there are people who can listen to me and understand exactly what every refugee and asylum seeker is going through. Telling my story reminds me of my duty as a journalist and activist, and also advocates to speak on behalf of the voiceless to represent the vulnerable and be a role model to the hopeless. Thank you for listening to my story. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. I'm actually having trouble for some reason turning uh, my camera off. But anyhow, I mean, turning it on. So anyhow, I hope you can see. I think that's better now. Thanks very much, Magdalene. And I have to say it was very powerful to hear how you have used your voice and the cost um, that you have borne by using your voice. And I want to thank you on behalf of uh, everyone here tonight for showing us the importance of voice. And it really leads very beautifully now into the action that we are now going to take because we now have an opportunity right here, right now, to all um, use our voices in a very simple way, a way that doesn't cost us in the way that it cost you, Magdalene. Um, but we're going to, uh, there's going to be PowerPoint um, slide come up now with instructions. Thank you. Um, and we're encouraging everyone to email uh, your local federal MP, asking them to advocate on key issues affecting people seeking asylum. So would you follow the link posted in the chat? Um, this will take you to the Do Gooder Action page. And all you need to do is fill in your residential address. And when you do that, your local MP will appear automatically. So it'd be good too if you could um, personalize that as much as you can. Um, you don't need an account to do this, by the way, but we would ask everyone right now to take the time to do that. Once you've done it, press send. And that means that right from tonight, we've got well over 100 people, 150 people plus contacting their uh, MPs. It's a really important thing um, to talk to, as a local constituent, to talk to your um, government representatives, as Bridget pointed out, and um, as others have pointed out too, with Magdalene just this then telling us important voice. Um, but also be past, beyond tonight, would you share this action with your networks, friends and families, and encourage them to use their voice also. Remember that it is this National Week of Prayer and Action, and we're only uh, in day three of it so far, so there's plenty more to do. So I'm just gonna give you 30 seconds to complete that, and then I'm going to ask our panelists 
to come back and join us briefly before we close up for the evening. Okay, I'm going to assume you've got that now. So could we have our four fantastic speakers uh, back now to join a panel um, where we're just going to do a couple of things before we finish off for the evening. Thank you. So we've heard tonight about using our time, resources, heart and voice uh, to build a, a better future. And um, we, what we, we don't have time for question and answers from all of our audience. So what um, the instructions are, if you do want to either find out more, if you want, um, I can see Maeve's putting something in, Maeve, the other Maeve, uh, Maeve Elrington from Jesuit Social Services is putting a, uh, something in the chat right now. If you want to have a more information about how you can use your time, resources, heart or voice to build a better future, um, please contact us at CAPSA and Maeve's put the um, information in there. If you also have a particular question uh, that you would like directed to one of the speakers or just to us at CAPSA generally, uh, also please feel free to do that. We'll take account of that and Maeve's just put the information there and we will follow up with you. We'll get back to you soon. But right now, before we close, um, I'm going to uh, ask each of you, and I'm going to ask you to be disciplined and not repeat everything you said, but to take the opportunity to say, okay, we're closing up this evening tonight and we want you to synthesize or simplify and name one thing. I'm asking you to name one thing that you believe that our participants tonight can go away and do as part of using their resources, time, hearts, or voice. One thing, they'll just hopefully had people contact their local MPs. So let's leave that one out of it. And the challenge is if you're not in there first, you're, you're gonna maybe have your idea stolen. You have to think of something else. Um, but I'm going to actually, I'll go in the order that we heard. And, and Shuja, even though you weren't technically a speaker, um, I know you'd have a lot of ideas, so I'm going to begin with you and then ask others. So just one thing uh, that you think people who are here, part of tonight, who obviously have a commitment to this issue because they're here in the middle of the week, could be having dinner or watching tally or doing something else, but they're here. So what's one thing you think that we could do as we leave here um, and into the future to help build the future that is a safe dignified one for people seeking asylum, for refugees, and therefore for broader Australian society. Shuja. Thank you very much, Julie. I'm going to keep it very simple because all of my ideas are in that letter to your MPs, so I hope people do that. But keeping that aside, I hope that the people here would consider um, supporting the work that GRS does in the ways that we've outlined um, I think we're facing a critical time where uh, demand for these services is increasing, uh, but support from the federal and state uh, governments in meeting those demands is decreasing. And so I think that's an important uh, 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 consideration to share with everybody here. I could go on and, and do other things, but I think that is, is okay. really the main thing that I, I think uh, could make a, a significant difference in the work of GRS. Great. Thanks very much, Shuja. Uh, Blaze. I think the only thing I can just say, say is that um, if you look at the TV, you watch the TV and you think about everything that is happening, obviously we get one feeling. Helplessness. You can't do much about it. There's so much that you, you know, that is happening. And I think after tonight, I would like everybody to go out there and think that it's, it's enough. It's enough for thinking we, you can't do anything. This is time now for us to take actions. This is time for us to do just one thing. You can use your voice by raising, by talking to your friends. You can take actions by actually supporting someone new in your community. And there are a lot of opportunities that we've shared here. So go with that. Don't be helpless anymore. Take actions. Thank you, Blaze. And um, I hope people really take the opportunity to check out the new program that you're uh, organization is offering. I know I'm part of a group that's looking into that ourselves 
And I think that's a really fantastic way for us to get the transformation of hearts and minds in the country to build relationships with people um, who've got that experience and to open our homes and hearts to people. So I hope people explore that as well. Thank you. Uh, Maeve. No worries. Um, I think to, to keep it simple, um, as, I, as I was saying, time, funds, food, employment opportunities, um, even if you just take the time to reflect and see, as Blaze was saying, if you can do one thing, if you could pick one of those things, um, yeah, any any little bit will help at this stage. And um, it goes a long way to giving people hope that things will get better and that they will be able to access opportunities and to, to build a life in Australia. So um, if you can pick something simple, um, even if it's, if it's just, giving a little bit of time or a small donation or thinking about a way that you could um, give someone an employment opportunity. I think that's that's where I'd be directing people. <laughs> Thanks very much, Maeve. And Bridget, one thing. Okay, um, I'll sort of have to use your voice. <laughs> Somebody's taken that one. Uh, and the other one is, um, to, this is a critical time for people's basic welfare. Uh, there hasn't been such a critical time. So to do something about fundraising uh, for uh, the groups who help in practical ways. Thanks, Bridget. And we've heard for a few of those tonight, J JRS, uh, the Bridget and Asylum Seeker Project. Um, and there are others, of course. So it's worth our mind keeping our mind on those things. And Magdalene. I think... Um... Everyone has said everything, but I will just ask that they should be our ambassador, serve as our ambassador, represent us in your communities, your churches, and everywhere. We want you just to give us an open mind and welcome us as people. Thank you very much, Magdalene. You had that difficult job of going after everyone else stole ideas, but you raised a really wonderful thing there. How can we use our communities, our faith groups, our churches, and um, uh, become ambassadors for these causes? So thank you so much. So I just now want to thank each of you. Um, we'll do a virtual clap. Uh, so much for your time, your commitment, uh, all the work that you do. Of course, tonight's just a little glimpse of what how you spend your days and nights and weekends, no doubt. So very grateful to you for all you do. And thank you for the time you've given us tonight, which has really enriched our understanding of the issues that uh, people are contending with and also prompting us to consider how we might use our time, resources, hearts and voice. So very grateful to you for that. Um, we will be taking action. And um, we know that I know that there's been messages going in from May Valrington from Jesuit Social Services about follow-up actions that can be taken. We'll be sending you uh, all the participants in tonight's webinar follow-up email, um, which will include suggestions uh, for how you can continue to take action. We've had a lot of ideas tonight and we're going to distribute some more as well. And we're also going to, of course, send you an evaluation about tonight. And it'd be nice if you filled that in too, so we know how we can continue to do these things and improve them for future CAPSA events. So just again, a quick reminder that we are only on day three of the National Week of Prayer in Action for 2022. So the next three days, we want to encourage you to take further action, to keep it up. As Blaze said, you know, don't lose hope. Right now, we can all do something. And I'm going back to the uh, uh, Shuja's reference to Rumi as well, um, that it's one person, and I love that to the, uh, but the collective uh, power, I suppose, of us, of all these individuals acting together can really help build the kind of world that we all want to live in, where everyone has a place, a safe place, um, is treated with dignity and we have the kind of just society where everyone gets to flourish. So on that note, I'm going to wind it up to thank all of our participants too. Thank you very much uh, on this evening coming um, out of your lounge room or wherever you are to set time aside to 
um, shows your commitment to the issue. So thank you so much on behalf of CAPSA, that, um, which is uh, a, the national it's an alliance of um, Catholic organisations across health, education, social services, um, the Bishops' Conference, the key bodies in the Catholic Church, and I'm very grateful, and I speak on behalf of Tamara Domicelli too, who co-chairs CAPSA with me, in thanking you very much. And I hope you have a wonderful evening now and enjoy the West rest of National Week for Prayer and Action. Thanks so much. Good night. <laughs>